first time here, I'm trying to position myself that I would, wouldn't be overwhelmed by the lights. Uh, so it's my first time in Lithuania, and it's really great to be here. Thank you for the hosting and everything. Um, so today, I'll speak a little bit about how you use games in order to deal with conflicts. And just as a start, a little bit about me. So I'm Tzachi. Um, I'm the headmaster of the biggest school in Israel for game development and design. It's a three-year program, and we just spoke about it in a round table of many educators from all over the world. I'm also one of the founders of the Israeli Game Developers Association. So everything that is happening in Israel relating to games go through me. I normally do the international connections. I really like connecting communities from all over the world. And I'm also the head of studio for Fun and Entertainment, which is a game studio that lies inside our school that is working on games for uh, Xbox and other consoles. Um, just a little bit about my experience. So I'm in the, in the game industry for the last 15 years. I'm doing mostly and still did and doing uh, educational games for children. So children and education is my personal love. And if you can connect children to other uh, means of social change, that's a blessing. So I've been working with companies from Disney to PBS Kids to um, Sesame Street on quite a lot of projects. Compedia, which is one of the oldest uh, companies in Israel, Tiltan, which is my school, and other companies out there. So yes, if you, as you can see, I worked on quite a sugary and pinky uh, games over the years, many brands, Dexter Lab, lots of things here. I wouldn't elaborate because it would take me an hour. So if you know something, I'm the one to blame. For some of those, yes, Kerbers, strawberry shortcakes, and the sorts. But today, I will try not to be um, too serious. I like the most interesting uh, talk before me about depression. That was actually a talk that I did last year. Um, I want to speak today about conflict. What is a conflict? What are the triggers for conflicts of any kinds? I will, most of the presentation will be uh, through games, examples of games from different places in the world, and we will speak about it, if you like, after my presentation, and conclusions, of course. So first of all, what is a, conf what is a conflict at all? So a conflict is a collision between ethnicities, between cultures, between opinions, between needs, and um, some of the ways to uh, solve a conflict, which is most commonly, is to just fight each other until somebody drops dead. But uh, my own solution is talking about it. So as you see, there are so many, so many types of conflicts in the world, from terror uh, operations to cybersecurity to narco-terrorism, so many. And this is actually outdated. And it's kind of scary when you zoom in and see how many types of uh, conflicts there are. Normally, they end miserably. There's Almost nobody that thinks about a peaceful solution. And I think in this presentation, I'll, I'll speak mostly about a man versus man type of conflict, not a man versus nature, which is mostly um, uh, typhoons and the sorts. So first of all, let's speak about the reasons for a conflict. So I'll start with superiority. Superiority groups think they are above others. They are special. They have special powers. They, are, they were the chosen ones. And if we speak about some of the examples, like the KKK were a nice example of um, uh, white supremacy, skin color. Um, another example, which you already know, that's a good movie, Iron Sky. I'm, I'm special. I'm connected to a special being that knows, that, I, that is all-knowing, and my group is higher than the others. Injustice. Uh, groups that are feeling that they are, uh, that are mistreated, that they are persecuted in the world. So IRA and the Black Panthers in the US, that's some of the examples. Vulnerability, groups that are feeling that they are also persecuted because the causes of what they seek are, are a niche. And that's for climate change, uh, gay rights, which is uh, very important and starting to be an issue. Uh, I think in Russia it's still um, it's still a problem. Distrust. So uh, Occupy Wall Street was a very good example of uh, prices of, uh, of living in a, in a country. That's from the biggest protest in Israel. 
Like I think uh, 1.5 million people went out to the streets of Tel Aviv and in other uh, places around the, the country and protests versus the, the prices of, of living in, in the country. Uh, while the salaries were uh, going uh, lower and lower or still the same, the prices were getting higher. So that leads, of course, for, uh, for uh, violent uh, conflicts and the sorts. Of course, we know, all know about this guy. I wouldn't even say his name. Uh, helplessness. We've seen that over the last 10 years, starting with Syrian refugees, something as an Israeli, as an Israeli soldier even, I saw so many, uh, so many countries involved in that conflict back in the north. And you, you don't even know, we would see a game about that. You don't even know who's fighting who and for what causes. So many terror organizations and, con and contradictions of conflicts are over there. So uh, Congo is also a sad story of genocides and tribes fighting each other just to show they are in power. And the Yazidis, actually a very peaceful group that was um, harassed by ISIS. They killed them just for being their own, uh, their nature. And uh, I think Israel helped Yazidis. We saved about around 100 people of their group and brought them to Israel and sheltered them. So that's a little something that we could do for them, but they are really peaceful and harmless. So to summarize this part of the presentation, we normally fight uh, for money. That's um, Funds are one of the main uh, reasons we fight for. We fight for oil and for water. You could see that situation in Africa where uh, countries that are bordering in water are you know, uh, harassing other uh, territories and there's fights over water and other uh, land resources. Religion is, I think, one of the top reasons for uh, conflicts. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, just harassing others because they have the different uh, religion, land, just conquering land because we want to, and manpower, and of course our ego, just because we can. So uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, as a great teacher taught me, it always starts with fear. We fear the other person, we, are, we fear the other country because they are stronger, because they are richer, we envy them, and fear is the, is the path to the dark side, actually. There starts, uh, the way that we want to own everything they have. We want to conquer and devour their resources, whether it's land resources or economic resources. And Gollum illustrated that very well. And sadly, in some reasons, in most of the cases, uh, the, 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 the easiest solution is just point a gun and kill that person because he thinks differently from what I do. Um, and they're exterminating uh, of all oppositions. So how do we oppose um, conflict? So one way is to read books about the situation, to research that, like I think most of us do. Some are creating viral videos. They go streaming from their own country and showing the situation and call for help or protests in the street like we saw in Israel. We did that quite a lot over the streets, but uh, it's, it's a problem. We discuss in social media, but that's also affecting only our own circles, not other circles that we are opposing for. So the, the effect is very small. And I think that as a game developers and game designers, we have power, we have skills that we can use for the benefits of society. We do, it doesn't mean that we have to stop everything we do and just do impact games, but we can use those skills in order to create and promote uh, peace and peace-supported games and actually illustrate the, the situation that is happening, whether it's in our country or in our friend's country. And uh, we can do that, actually. We, we need to let other players experience the conflict, put themselves in, in our shoes, and let them experience what it is to be humiliated, what it means to, be, to, to have sacrifice in their lives or to lose someone. Someone, and as a soldier that serves in Lebanon and in Gaza, I lost many friends over different conflicts. Some of them, I thought they were really stupid. I was, I was standing in the, in the Second Lebanon War on a hill and looking down as a soldier on tanks going back and forth, seeing uh, guerrilla warriors come uh, appear from the ground, and it all looks to me like Age of Empires or some, some kind of game. Well, 30 days ago, I was back in my office creating games, and that's 
that's where I am now, in the middle of nowhere, trying to protect myself and fighting a, a cause that I don't even believe. And eventually, um, that's, that's what he let no, no uh, specific solution. So, I want to speak about several games. I'm just starting. So the first game is Bury Me, My Love. It's uh, an interesting game about uh, a refugee, a Syrian refugee, uh, running away from Syria. She's called Nour. Nour. She's leaving her husband and her family and her home uh, back in Syria. And the only way she can, they can communicate together is through like a WhatsApp uh, application on a mobile phone. So the entire game is a collection of conversations between, them, between themselves. And the scary moments are where, where then the, there is a huge silence, when there is no answer from the other side. Like, what's happening to my family? What's happening for my, to my child? Is there, are they still, al still alive? And that's, um, I want to show a short video about that. Do we have sound? Guys, sound. Guys? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go back here. Can we have sound for the videos? That's important. I mean, I can sing along the, the presentation, but that would be horrible for you guys. I was never good at that. We tested that yesterday. Okay, we have sound? Yes? We don't have sound? Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll just uh, take some time. So who's here ever been in a war situation? Is there anybody? I don't see any of you. Yeah, that's a problem. So, uh, yeah. Who's ever here been in Israel? Yeah, you've been in Israel. So what, what have you experienced? I think the, the, the first impression of somebody that is visiting the first time in Israel is why so many soldiers are carrying guns. So for us, it's very natural to carry guns for, for other foreigners. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so I don't need to. Okay, <laughs> that's good. There's no sound. Come on, we tested it yesterday. <laughs> uh, without sound, it will be a problem to illustrate something. Sorry, guys, that's technical problems which I'm not responsible for. <laughs> yeah, I can? Yes. We won. Thank you, guys. So the next uh, game I want to speak about, I don't know how many of you have played it, it's called Valiant Hearts. It's about World War I uh, soldiers. It's, it's a very unique game because it reminded me some of my experiences in the war. But it's told entirely, it's an episodic game, and it's told uh, specifically from the letters that soldiers that fell, died in that war, left for the loved ones. And, uh, it's, it's quite emotional, it's quite different from what uh, Ubisoft, Ubisoft was the developer of that game, uh, the studio in Montreal, and it's something that is very different from their graphical style, and it's not something that they normally do, and it's nice to see big studios uh, getting into that uh, area. It's already, I, I think, about three years old or four years old game, and uh, I really recommend on playing that. 
Uh, another amazing game from Poland, from 11-bit studio, is This War of Mine. And I really liked it, that game because you don't play any elite soldier or a special unit soldier that needs to assassinate other units. You are playing a group of people, unfortunate people that are stuck in an abandoned building on the day. During the day, you have snipers aiming at you and shooting you down, so you cannot really go outside of the building. And you need to survive. You need to build your own bed. You build your own refrigerator, get uh, materials so you can survive, so you can eat something, get, me get medicine, so you can go only at night to scavenge from other houses. But in those other houses, there are other people that are trying to survive as well. So that's an interesting mechanics. And you always do compromises. You lose some of your crew. What you see here on the right side, it's, um, it's actually, uh, you see real faces with their stories and everything. And it's really touching. I tried to finish this game for like three times. Only the fourth time I was managing emotionally to, to finish that. It reminded me so much of, of experiences of the war that I had. And then they did the unspeakable and added a, an, an extension of children, like that is called the little ones, where you also have children with you that affects your decision-making process. And then your first priority is to defend, to shelter the child, to make them survive first on your expense and on others' expense. So that's, uh, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's hard to, to listen and to see the questions for example, why do people kill other people? It's like something that when your child is asking, it's a process. You need to understand and think how you would answer that and it, because it shapes your, your child life and, and moral uh, compass. Another interesting educational game, it's quite old, I think eight years in the making. It's called Kwandari, and here you're a captain of a delegation that is going to a new star. You need to explore it, you need to you need to do excavations. And actually, you need to decide which kind, of, uh, which kind of government or which kind of ruling will be on that planet. Will it be very militantic? Will it be very like engineering or researchers? And there's so, many, uh, so much teamwork and skills here invested. Uh, it depends on what character you choose to, to play. Um, the next project is something that is very close to my heart. I was one of the founders and the board members of Games for Peace. It's a non-profit association that we uh, established five years ago. And it started when we, we were speaking to uh, children, Jewish children and Palestinian children. And we heard that. Like, I don't trust, I don't trust Jewish people. They're all liars. And that's like a 12-year-old. And then we ask somebody... You know, all Arabs are terrorists. And that's when we understood that we have the power as game developers to connect children in conflict zones. We actually um, decided to approach Microsoft and talk to them about using Minecraft and other games in order to connect children together in a nine, nine weeks activities quest where they don't know who they play with or against. Uh, we had automatic translation, so when you write something in Hebrew, it sends, uh, for example, for the other side in Arabic, depending on your, your defined role, but they were playing together. Uh, there is no conquering here. There is only like quests which demands teamwork as the weeks go by and by and by. Um, that's, I don't know if you, you, you probably can read that, but that's like they, they say, it's so much fun to meet you again. I want to, to, to attend another lesson. And that's, they need to defend their, uh, their village from zombies. And that's where they say, zombies attacks our village. Let's do something. And after that nine weeks, we, we uh, make everybody meet together physically. They are partying together. They are celebrating their, their, their freedom, their communications. They get to know each other better, the, the names behind the avatars, behind the players. And that's one picture of that. And for example, statistics are striking. You, we would see a uh, huge advancement, like appreci appreciation of the other, uh, understanding the positive characteristics of the other, like before and after the, the process and the game the willingness to interact with one another. And, not, and those are children that treated each other like enemies. They wouldn't, wouldn't be able to speak even together. 
And we use that model in Georgia and in other countries around the world, about 10 uh, countries and uh, over dozens and dozens of schools. And just in, uh, about a year ago, we were speaking at the UN and we got the innovation prize by the UN. Uh, so that was another stamp that our way is kind of on the right way, but uh, we want to do more and I'm doing that today. So I'll show you another video on that. Thanks to the project Play to Talk, Arab and Jewish school children who are separated into different educational systems in Israel can change their perceptions of one another. The focus is on reducing prejudices through positive interaction since negative stereotypic beliefs about the other are still omnipresent. Play to Talk uses a platform that children immediately feel comfortable with, that of the popular video game Minecraft. In the project, children from a pair of Jewish and Arab schools meet on a weekly basis to play Minecraft together from their school's computer rooms. Rather than having one school play against the other, the children are divided into two teams, each mixed between the two schools. The children are presented with a set of challenges that require increasing levels of cooperation and collaboration. To overcome the language barrier, Minecraft's chat system is equipped with an automatic online translation service. Throughout the program, the virtual world is supplemented by face-to-face -face meetings, where the children discover the real people behind the avatars. The virtual and real-life experiences have a lasting effect. Pupils not only overcome stereotypes, many of them also add their counterparts to their social media circles and stay in touch. So there is a persistent change in attitudes towards the other group among children who completed the project. A remarkable achievement that can promote intercultural dialogue and understanding. Another game that uh, was really interesting, I'll talk about it briefly, called Nanu. Nanu is divided in, in Korean, shows the, the world before the, uh, the separation of North Korea and South Korea, and it's actually a very metaphoric game that lets children experience the separation reasons and let them explore each half. Uh, it, it talks about two, uh, two lovers that are seeking each other, and the quest is like finding each other and surviving the game. Um, that's another game which is based in Israel. Uh, the children are divided into two groups, two tribes that actually resent each other. They don't actually know each other, but in the game we uh, make them go through a process where they get to know each other habits, each other assumptions, and then give them several quests in the game in order to cooperate together, and we measure that over time. So that's another. Two tribes. One magic stone and a long journey to the land of fire. Only the one who will learn how to overcome the differences between the tribes and will know how to use the powers of each and every one will find the magic stones and save the world. The Journey to the Land of Fire workshop is an innovative tool tailored for primary schools, which strengthen skills significant for a better acceptance of the other, designed and developed in cooperation with leading researchers from the Applied Center for Psychology of Social Change at the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya Israel. Empirically validated as efficient in reduction of stereotypical perceptions, So, are you ready for the journey to the land of fire? Another interesting game talks about Cyprus, the separation of Cyprus, the Greek side and the Cyprus side. And it's actually a web game for children where they can spot the differences between different places in Nicosia, specifically. 
what was before and what is now and the reason behind it. So it's mostly like a kind of a historical adventure. I really recommend that. Another related, and I spoke about Syria and Syria refugees before in my talk. So uh, interesting game is a text-based game. I think it's a, it's a four-year-old game. It speaks about the two first years of the Syria conflict. And it's, a, as I said, it's a text adventure, like make your own adventure kind of a game, where you can play three characters. You can select each time you play. Uh, one of them is a rebel fighter, the other is an American journalist, and the third, third character is a pregnant woman. And then you would see your, your selections, how it changes over time after you play a character of one sort, you see you, you are changing actually your path of action in order to survive the, um, the conflict, and it, every time it's a different outcome. Uh, just a little bit about it. Interesting, very small game, mini game that I played, and I think I, I really liked. I, I don't think I liked the game because it's just like overcoming a side that is fighting you by selecting whether you're Ukraine or you're Russian. It was in the days of the, of the conflict between those two countries uh, over the Krim island. Uh, but I really liked the, when you finish the game, whenever the result you get, you get like game over. You won the battle, but lost the game. A lot of civilians were killed, and that's it's really important. It's not just soldiers. When you're involved in a war, you have so many other casualties, like innocent people that were just there. For example, in the Lebanon war, my own my own experience is that when we were in the field in South Lebanon and we fought there, we spotted like a lonely house where two elder people were located, and they were stranded. Like everything was dead around them. Like their, their sheep and their, their animals, everything was dead. They just survived. They didn't do anything to anyone. They didn't actually knew about the world. So we, we took them out of Lebanon. We actually secured them and let them out. But that was like, they were so scared and un understand that they, they didn't know what, what's going on. They, didn't, they weren't even part of that conflict. So uh, lots of civilians. Um, Another interesting game is Darfur is Dying. I think it's a Danish, Danish game, I think so. Um, Darfur's story is very sad. Darfur had 2.5 million uh, refugees and 400,000 casualties. We, we can call it a genocide. And uh, some, of the, some of the refugees came to Israel and I hosted some of them and I actually got to know about the game through their eyes and I actually let them play that. And it was very emotional to see that. In the game, you need to search for water, to build bricks, to sustain your own village. And it's something that those actions are very trivial for us. It's, it's, it's basic survival for us because we don't even think about it. But for those people, that was part of their lives. Um, so yeah, you have so many uh, mini quests and you have to maintain your camp and you need to work as a team, which is important. Uh, another game is, uh, is a VR game that is placing, uh, an Israeli, uh, placing yourself in a, in a position of an Israeli soldier or a Hamas terrorist, and I'll let you see the video in order to understand what's going on. Can we raise the volume a little bit? Thank you. This project was born out of frustration as a photojournalist. I have covered conflicts for the last 15 years, and I knew I could not just do the same when I became a father. Yet, I was not done with trying to understand wars. My friend in Israel, when they know I'm heading for Gaza, cannot help themselves but to wish me luck and to stay safe. 
They believe a lot of people in Gaza are irrational. But also when I spend weeks in Gaza working and I'm about to return to Israel, my Palestinian friends are telling me exactly the same. Just be careful there. So there is a bigger story than the war itself and perhaps this is the one I need to explore and share. This project is rooted in my experience going from one side to the other in many different wars and conflicts, finding that people's dreams, hopes and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. Who's your enemy? For the audience to understand and feel that, we will use artificial intelligence, cognitive science and the latest technologies in virtual realities. בנשק, בדרכים אחרות שיכולות לפגוע בנפש. אם זה ב... Here is the concept. The Oculus Rift is a virtual reality headset. It blocks your vision and places you in a virtual world that we are creating. Fox Harrell, a professor, and Emil Bruno, a researcher, both from the MIT, will provide the analytical backbone. When the audience walks in between enemies, we will measure bias and how they physiologically respond to the installation. And in using neuroscience research, we could be able to discover how much empathy has been created. I am planning to bring the fighters of seven other long-standing conflicts together in the very same way. You create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy because the society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side? I'll, I'll go by uh, some games. Um, so Papers, Please is, uh, I'm sure everybody knows about that game. Um, I think the whole issue of holding people from crossing to the other side of a border and having the conflicts that this game shows is interesting and painful at the same time. I experienced it uh, firsthand in Gaza, I think, with the refugees from both sides. And it's uh, something uh, you need to think about. Um, Cloud Chasers is also a game about a father and a daughter that are refugees. They left everything behind and they need to survive. I think we have time for that. So, uh, to summarize everything, and I have a little surprise at the end. Um, so first of all, it's very important when we design games, uh, especially for impact, and that's what I do for the last several years, not just educational games, show the, the, show the truth, show the, the situation as it is. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Don't try to make it all nice ending. Make it, make it hurt. I think that's, that's a problem with many impact-related uh, games that I see over the market. And also try to put the player in the, in, in the conflict uh, shoes. Uh, let them experience what it means to leave everything behind, to be a refugee, to lose someone for them, from their family. It's, it's not easy, but I know as a game designer it's, it's hard, very hard to do that. 
And because this subject is very heavy, it's very painful, you need to replay over and over large parts of the games. So you need to give some breathers in between where the player can rest a little bit before he continues to the next episode. It was really important, and I think some of the games that I showed did that very well. And there's no happy hand. Normally, it's a process. There's no, nothing uh, get resolved very fast. It's, uh, you, you need to hope to maintain and sustain relationship and make other people understand what people in conflict actually feel. And just think about the long run. Don't just make a very short game that is ending now, but try to connect the community to it. Try to, um, try to learn from the people that are actually physically in that, uh, in that place. Um, you can also use charities, or there are many organizations that help game developers create those kind of games. Games for Change is one of them. There are other American organizations that support indie developers that are dealing with peace-related, conflict-related issues. Um, so if anybody has questions, um, you can speak to me either now or after the presentation, but I want like a very short movie about, like to show you about Israel, what is the conflict history? For some people who think that Israeli conflicts are just Palestinian and Jewish, so I really want to show you that. <laughs> Thank you, Sahi. <laughs> Are there any questions? We have time for a couple. Questions? 
questions, please. Yes, question, brave guy. Thank you for the presentation and a really great job uh, about this game Talk to Play among the school children. Yes, and from games I, to I wanted to ask you, do you think it could be expanded and used as a connection between people living in both countries, Israel and Palestine? Because now I understood it's only for communities living in Israel, right? But could so it be somehow expanded? What's your opinion? So uh, we use that model in, uh, I, I think I mentioned that in Georgia, uh, between uh, several communities that are fighting for many years together, and we did that in several Arabic countries as well. And uh, I think we also tried that uh, in the US with some communities. So it's a, it's, a, it's a model, we can do that everywhere. It needs like, we need to go to those schools and those communities and speak to them and see that they are willing. Because at start there are lots of resistance for that. But um, what we think now is to create more, more, more games, more platforms in order to connect those children. But yes, it, definitely it's a model that we researched and all along the process we evaluate that and see how, uh, how for example, we learned that uh, one part of the equation are teachers. Because when we went to teachers, some of them would say, why do you even talk to Arabic people? Why do we talk to Jewish people? They are, they are enemies. We don't want that in the equation. So we took in the, the, the teachers, and they are part of the team working on that platform. We listened to them, and we involved them in the design of that platform. And another thing that we, we learned that there's parents, parents in different areas, in the Arabic side, in Jewish side, in, in Georgian side, some of them are like, why do you even play games in order to learn? You need to learn not to play games. Games are for, you know, it's, it's just for play. You, you can't benefit from games. And we had that uh, discussion like earlier in the educational roundtable where I was attending What's the use of games? How can we use games as an educational tool and a social change tool? So yes, definitely it's a model that we can utilize at schools or at communities to connect them. And uh, yeah, thank you for, it, for your question. Thank you, anybody else? Okie dokie, thank you, Sai. Oh, there are questions. Good questions, yes, I like questions. Okay, so this is going to be less of a question, more of a comment, if I may. Yeah, just speak a little louder. Oh, okay. Uh, well, some of these examples were really great, I think, uh, especially ones that try to show both sides. Yes. As looking at history, we can't sometimes say that some side was right or wrong, but uh, practically... Oh, well, always, both sides think that they were the right ones, that they are the just ones. Yes. So I'm very, very wary about some of the examples where it seems like only one side is shown. And more or less the game then sides with that side, like a refugee, like a, some, some soldier only on one side, not both. And uh, that make arise if we make games about current issues, where we don't really know who was really right or who was yes. more wrong. So that's more of my comment, to be very aware about showing the one side in some of these games. So, so first of all, I don't think there is right or wrong. Like, the world is not good and evil. The world is gray. And there is, like, it, it, I think a conflict is based on compromising, like understanding the other, trying to be in the shoes of the other. And that's what we are trying to do in our projects. I, I know there are games that are showing only one side, but just think that there are several different communities that are playing those games. So for some of them, yeah, it's, it's prejudiced, and it's very hard to create an impact game. That's why if I would be able to collect all the impact games that I know, I would maybe have 20. Whereas the game industry is full of games. So that's why I think we should try more and more to perfect our skills and create those kind of games in order to show each side. And it's not just right or wrong or one side or the other. My history in your eyes is different 
It's nev never mind uh, which side we are or even if we are in conflict. If I, my view on the, on the French history, for example, is my view. It's not a French person living in that country dealing with those conflicts that his father was fighting in a war. It's very different. So I agree with that. You need to show both sides and let the players experience and then decide. But it's always uh, uh, you know, a, a question of funding and of content of how many people are working on that game because you would need to show several sides and let them pick their sides. Maybe they have to pick both sides in order to continue in the game. And many games do that. In fantasy, you can play both sides. But uh, I think that's a good question. Yes. That's one of the objectives as an industry, I believe. 